Hello, and welcome back to the Living Well Podcast by Jefferson Health. I'm Carly Williams. And I'm Jessica Lopez. We're continuing our series of conversations with physicians at Jefferson Health about the top questions they receive from their patients. In this episode, we connect with cardiologist, Dr. Darius Farzad. That's right. We discuss everything from how your lifestyle could be helping or hurting your heart health, the causes of heart disease, how to manage high cholesterol, and the unassuming symptoms you need to be aware of that could be distress signals from your heart. Here's our interview with Dr. Farzad. My name is Dr. Darius Farzad. I am a cardiologist. I did cardiology and then critical care training here at Jefferson Hospital. So I've been here for just over four years now. To start, when should someone start seeing a cardiologist? The easy answer is if they've had any history of cardiac disease, you know, anyone that's had prior history of a heart attack, congestive heart failure, arrhythmia, any sort of established cardiac diagnosis. Those are people that should be following pretty regularly with a cardiologist. Beyond that, I think people that have standard sort of uh, risk factors for cardiac disease, whether it's things like high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, smoking history, et cetera, I think it's completely reasonable to get established with a cardiologist and we can help optimize those risk factors as much as possible and determine if and when testing is specifically needed to look for things like coronary disease or any other things that we need to screen for. Beyond those situations, I would say if anyone is concerned, if anyone's having symptoms that they think could be cardiac in nature, if their primary care doctor recommends them or if someone just feels like they would benefit from seeing a cardiologist, if it's family history, I I don't think it's ever wrong to see us at least once and then we can triage what needs to be done for follow-up and and further management. I just had a quick follow-up question. Should you and do you need a referral to see a cardiologist? It depends on your insurance coverage. I think a lot of cases people will need a referral from their primary care doctor, but I don't think that's a hard and fast rule. So it really depends on the circumstances. Hmm. And what does a cardiologist do on your first visit? Yeah. So uh, initial things, I mean, the history and physical is a staple of really any medical visit, I think. Teasing out what are the reasons the person is in the office, you know, whether it's because of specific symptoms they're having that need to be evaluated or if they were referred because of a specific diagnosis or risk factors, really digging into those details, making sure we're getting as much information as possible. Beyond that, doing a really detailed physical exam. The physical exam, I think, especially in cardiology, we really rely on to screen for physical diagnoses that might need to be worked up further with imaging, with an echocardiogram, for example, and then discussing management things that need to happen, whether it's more testing, whether it's talking about risk factors and how to sort of optimize them as much as possible. In a lot of instances, that doesn't involve medicines. In some cases, it certainly does. Those are kind of the basics. And then an EKG, that's a pretty standard part of our visit too. I'm just wondering if when somebody sees their cardiologist for the first visit, what kind of symptoms could they be logging that would be helpful for you? The most common ones that we see are things like chest pain, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, feeling like people are going to pass out or episodes where they passed out before. But that being said, I've talked to people that are having any sort of number of symptoms that seem like they could or couldn't be related to a cardiac diagnosis, headaches, abdominal complaints. The thing about some Forms of heart disease is that they can manifest in a lot of different ways. And I think the other important thing about heart disease is that it's something that can be sort of systemic, meaning a lot of different organ systems can be implicated uh, and tied to what's sort of more centrally a cardiac diagnosis. So for us, we need to be pretty vigilant about taking a good history and, and teasing out those details. And how can someone improve their own heart health? First and foremost, the standard risk factors that I mentioned before, things like blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, those are all diagnoses that the staple of managing them is focusing on dietary adherence and trying to build a good exercise regimen. A lot of that's avoiding unhealthy behaviors as well as focusing on what are healthy behaviors to incorporate. Obviously, cigarette smoking is a gigantic one. And then beyond that also, things like medication adherence, that's a huge one that we talk to our patients about constantly. People can have a lot of barriers to doing the sort of things that we think are straightforward, whether it's socioeconomic barriers or health literacy, whatever those things are, we have to be cognizant of those as we come up with treatment plans and work with our patients. And is there a way you can check your heart health from home? Now, probably more easily than in the past, we have a lot of technology at our disposal. People have Apple watches. Devices like that can be very helpful for things like arrhythmia screening. 
people that have home blood pressure cuffs. I was in the office this morning and I think almost every one of my patients or most of them, at least I talked to about home blood pressure monitoring and relaying that data to me so that I could get a little more guidance in terms of how to adjust their medications. Because the reality is we see people in the office and it's a snapshot of what's going on. So it's helpful to have data from home. The one thing I will say about that though, is if people are going to check their blood pressure, especially people that are doing it on a regular basis, titrating medications, it's helpful to bring that cuff into the office at least once just to sort of make sure that it's uh, calibrated correctly. Just because sometimes those home blood pressure cuffs, the wrist cuffs, it might not be as reliable. I have a question going back to those lifestyle things that you recommend to all your patients. If that feels overwhelming to someone who maybe isn't doing any of those things and just hearing like be healthier feels intimidating. I'm wondering, is there a starting point that you would tell patients? Like if you start doing this one lifestyle change, it could make a great difference on your heart. That's a really good question. To get to the first part of your question, we have to be very cognizant of not throwing too much at patients at once and giving them too much to tackle. I think diet is obviously a huge piece of the puzzle. And especially, unfortunately, in the States, a pretty widespread problem that's very layered in terms of the things that tie into it. From a dietary perspective, we've adopted talking to patients about the Mediterranean lifestyle. So really avoiding things like fried foods, a lot of sweets, soda, processed foods, a ton of empty carbohydrates, things like pasta, rice, and really incorporating more things like fruits and vegetables and nuts and cooking with olive oil instead of butter and using more lean meats like grilled meats and fish and chicken and turkey instead of red meat. I tell people get at least five days a week where you're getting 30 to 60 minutes of exercise where you're getting your heart rate up. We need to be aware of what a patient's limitation and circumstances are. Those things that I mentioned are not feasible in a lot of cases, not to mention a lot of the most delicious food just happens to be very unhealthy. So we have to be really realistic about these things when we talk to patients and and find a balance that's going to work for them and be practical. It seems empowering for a patient to tell their doctor if it's not feasible for them to do what you're asking them to do. If you're giving the advice of exercising, empowering people not to just write it off as like, oh yeah, sure. But saying it's actually really hard for me to do that what are other options? Because then it could just open up a dialogue of maybe swimming would be a better option if you have joint pain or anything like that. And maybe it helps establish a more personal relationship with your provider. Absolutely. Yeah. It helps if we get to know our patients and get inside of kind of their lives a little bit and figure out what the day-to-day looks like and what we can do to affect positive changes within that framework. I I agree 100%. Diving into heart disease specifically, can you talk about the different types of heart disease? So there's a lot. Um, (laughs) I I think the big categories that we think about are coronary artery disease and other sort of manifestations of vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. You can include stroke maybe within that umbrella a little bit. And then congestive heart failure. That's a diagnosis that's become more and more prevalent as time has gone on, as the American population has aged and we've gotten much better at treating it. And there's a lot of treatment modalities that are at our disposal that are helping people survive for longer periods with diagnoses like congestive heart failure that in the past have been very life limiting. And and that's still true to some extent. We in cardiology consider congestive heart failure. It's kind of the cancer in some ways of our practice. Now, there's a lot of different subtypes of congestive heart failure and the prognosis and the management, it, it really ranges. That's not to say that every patient that has that diagnosis is some kind of immediately terminal diagnosis, but there's a lot that goes into managing that condition and working up the causative factors. Beyond those things, arrhythmias, AFib is something that's every time you turn on the TV, you see an ad for that and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar shows up on the screens. That's something that's very prevalent throughout the American population that has implications in terms of stroke risk. And general heart disease is another big category that uh, we're going to see more and more of. Again, as our treatments have improved over time, we have a lot of patients that are thankfully surviving for a longer period and aging into adulthood with a lot of those types of diagnoses of congenital heart conditions. And it's something that we need to be pretty literate in terms of how we recognize and manage it. And do different heart diseases develop instantly or over time? I would say in in most cases, they're not things that develop overnight. There are certainly heart conditions that can happen pretty acutely. But when you talk about things like coronary disease, when you talk about congestive heart failure, again, recognizing that there's a ton of different subtypes within that. Generally, these are conditions that develop over the course of months to years, really. But 
Well, I think what's fascinating about cardiology is there's such a wide spectrum. There's uh, diseases that cross into you know other organ systems, and there's a lot of interplay between those things. One thing we see in the hospital a lot, for example, is patients with what's called a stress cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy. Takotsubo is a Japanese word for octopus pot, and that's kind of the the classic form of this disease is that's the shape that the heart kind of takes. It looks like an octopus pot where part of the heart is very sort of bowed out like a pot. That's something that we can we see much more often than I was led to believe in medical school. And uh, that's something that can develop pretty quickly over the time course of hours to days. But something that we can treat and typically resolves with time. But that's just kind of one example of something that can develop on a more short-term duration. But in general, a lot of the things I'm talking about tend to develop over a longer period of time. And moving on to cholesterol, what causes high cholesterol and what are some of the ways people can manage it? The big thing is just sort of dietary adherence. That's a big sort of factor that can contribute to it. Beyond that, genetics is a really important piece of the puzzle. We've developed more testing that's allowed us to recognize genetic abnormalities that can tie into hypercholesterolemia, which can have different forms. And there's a lot more treatments that are at our disposal now to manage cholesterol, which can be a risk factor for things like coronary disease and stroke. So there's newer medications that we have that we didn't use to that are very effective, especially for patients that don't tolerate the classic treat, treatment, which is statins. Statins are effective medications for managing most forms of dyslipidemia or abnormal cholesterol levels, but they have side effects. And we see it pretty commonly where patients come to the office and they're having things like muscle aches, cramping, muscle weakness, joint pains, fatigue, that can be related to things like statins. So we have to be able to recognize that and work around those things and when appropriate, prescribe alternatives. So aside from the medications, again, diet and exercise really needs to be the staple of how we manage abnormal cholesterol levels rather than just relying on medications, but but they go hand in hand, I would say. Mm. Can we talk a little bit about the unassuming symptoms that you shouldn't ignore when it comes to your heart health? Yeah, absolutely. In general, like I said, chest pain is probably the most common complaint that we see in the hospital. And it's something that can be pretty tough to tease out in terms of whether or not it's related to the heart and what people ultimately worry about, which is coronary disease. I would say in general, if people are experiencing that symptom, even if it seems unconvincing, it's good to let a provider know about it, let the cardiologist know about it, and let us sort of tease out if it sounds more classic or not for angina or you know pain related to coronary disease. Hmm. What I would say is that One of the more common scenarios I've seen in the hospital, and I I don't mean to freak people out, but especially working in the cardiac ICU, as as I've started doing recently, people that ride out chest pain at home for days and days that they kind of chalk up to heartburn. That's especially a complaint I've seen. And again, that's usually older patients with other risk factors, not like a 25-year-old who has a little bit of heartburn, so I don't want to cause a panic. But in general, I would say if people are having chest discomfort, teasing out whether it's related to things like heartburn or a musculoskeletal problem or cardiac disease, it can be tricky. It can be tricky for us as providers. And a lot of times we really have to rely on ancillary testing. Uh, But in general, if people are having new symptoms that are concerning, it's the kind of thing that they should be talking to their doctor about and being careful about just Googling stuff and, and using that to guide what they're doing. Because while there's information available on the internet, it's not always reliable. A good reminder. I also wanted to just say this is kind of off topic but my sister is always like you need to be careful I don't want you to stress too much and like affect your heart health I'm just curious how stress affects your heart stress is huge I mean we can talk about it in kind of a vague sense of mindfulness and all that kind of stuff but I I think there's pretty clear physical correlations with how stress can impact your hormone levels, how that interplay can definitely have implications for things like cardiovascular disease. When we talk about, I mentioned before about angina, our classic description of it is pain that's brought on with exercise or stress. So that's definitely something that we pay attention to. And and for me in the office, when I see patients, a lot of times they talk about stress as a potential trigger for their symptoms. And you know whether or not it's something that's implicated with coronary disease in that instance, I think it's still really important to address, you know, it gets into this discussion about mental health and I think how undertreated it is in a lot of instances, especially here in the States. And a lot of that's resource driven or driven by the fact that resource availability, I think is not what we would like it to be for mental health services. But I I think it's hugely important. I think it absolutely plays into someone's physical health, cardiovascular health, 
And so I think it's a, a big part of what we have to address with our patients as well. What is one thing you wish your patients would do to improve their heart health? And conversely, what is the one thing you wish patients would stop doing that's hurting their heart health? Things that I wish patients would do. I mean, I think it's always nice when patients are really proactive and they're doing things like symptom monitoring at home, watching their blood pressure, watching their blood sugars when they come to the office and they have data available, those kind of things. I think that's great. And I think that really, that makes my job easier for sure. And at the end of the day, I tell people I can try to do everything I can to help in the office, but at the end of the day, things aren't going to work if if patients aren't taking responsibility for their own health and well-being as doing their part at home. And, and, and we have to help them do that effectively. And then I, the flip side of that coin, I guess, is things to avoid is I talked about risk factors and avoiding unhealthy behaviors. That's a big part of what I talk about in the office is just avoiding sort of the dietary indiscretions or making sure people are getting enough exercise and, and smoking is a huge one. I wouldn't be doing my job well if I didn't talk about smoking cessation during office visits. That's probably the most important, biggest thing they can do for their health is to quit smoking in a lot of cases. I talked before about like Google medicine a little bit. And I wouldn't discourage people from researching and being well-informed about what's going on. That being said, I think we just have to make sure our patients have our expertise to lean on to contextualize some of the information they're getting externally, and just to make sure that they're not over-relying on information that might be a little out of context and maybe not always reliable. Definitely. And what question do you wish your patients would ask you in terms of managing their heart health? Taking a proactive approach, just like, what can I be doing differently? I think Framing it like that can be helpful just to make sure that we're giving them the proper guidance and giving some autonomy to the patient rather than just building this dynamic where they're relying on everything that we're doing and saying and maybe not understanding all those things or not taking the responsibility that's needed. I think it goes both ways. So if that doctor-patient relationship is working best, I think that's how it should function. Be sure to check out the show notes for additional resources, including the link to the Living Well blog where we publish full episode transcripts. In our next episode, we're following breast surgeon Dr. Stefania Nolano as she gets a preventative mammogram screening. We're hoping to demystify the experience and answer top questions about mammograms. So if you have any, send us an email at livingwell at jefferson.edu or slide into our DMs on social. And as always, if you enjoy our podcast, we truly appreciate a rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Fun fact, the full podcast episodes are also available on our YouTube channel at Jefferson Health. Production support for today's episode provided by Brittany Raffalak and Barbara Henderson. We're your hosts, Carly Williams and Jess Lopez. Be well.